Welcome to Star Talk Sports Edition. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today we're talking about what goes on inside the brains of a drone racer and a NASCAR racer during competition. How do you get inside that? And what's going on? And how focused are they? Or, how, how, or are they in the zone? And what does it even mean to be in the zone? And I got with me Paul Nurk Nurkala. Nurk, welcome back to Star Talk. I am so excited to be here. Now, who are you? You're the, like the 2018 Drone Racing League champion. Uh, uh, forgive me, I didn't know that you could be a champion in that. Just, uh, just, just saying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there there was a long time where I didn't think so either. But <laughs> and neither did your mother as you were doing this in the basement, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. My my in laws were a little bit worried when I was just playing with toy drones all the time, but then they saw me on TV and they're like, "Okay, maybe it's okay." <laughs> there you go. And you host a YouTube channel called Nurk FPV. That's right. Yep. Uh, FPV stands for what? First person view. So the Nurk. drones that we fly, we wear goggles over our eyes, and there's a camera on the drone, and we fly it as if we're on board. Oh, so rather than at a distance, trying to not to hit stuff. Exactly. Right, right. Okay, and uh, we've got with us an authentic, real live human being NASCAR racer. Uh, great to have you, Anthony Alfredo. Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it and uh, looking forward to chatting with you all for the first time. Excellent. And you race in the Xfinity series. What, what does that mean precisely? That is the second highest level in NASCAR racing competition. NASCAR actually has three national series levels, and the NASCAR Xfinity Series is sort of the feeder series for the NASCAR Cup Series, which is the highest level and top tier of our sport. Okay, so it's not NASCAR for Gen Xers, right? <laughs> Just <wondering>. No. <laughs> okay. And you race car number 21, a Chevy Camaro? Yes, um, for Richard Childress Racing. Okay, excellent, excellent. And of course, coming back to Star Talk is our favorite neuroscientist. In fact, she's the only neuroscientist we know, <laughs> Heather Berlin. Heather. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Okay, uh, you're in the, uh, the faculty at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thanks for coming back to help us get inside the heads of these two uh, highly focused gentlemen. And of course, in Star Talk Sports Edition, we've got Chuck Nice, my co host. Uh, hey, hey, and Gary Riley, my other co-host. So, guys, uh, you travel, I think, at different speeds. So, so Nurk, how fast are your drones going? Top. So, our drones travel at a top speed of ninety miles an hour, but they can get from zero to ninety in less than a second. Ooh, wow. ooh, wow. ooh, Anthony, you you want some of that kind of acceleration, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. We definitely <laughs> don't have that type of acceleration in our cars, but we do get to go a little bit faster. We go. Uh, just about 200 miles per hour, some places just over that. So we get to a little bit of a higher top speed, but that acceleration is usually what gets you a little bit quicker physically and mentally than the ultimately top speed does. Now, here's something what I wonder about the physics of this. Uh, I've been on the, on, a, on the freeway where we have cars sort of basically obeying the speed limit with some distance between them. And there's always somebody who's racing through the traffic. Okay, and they're quickly dodging back and forth, left and right. And I look at that, and it looks dangerous. However, if they're going twice as fast as everyone else, isn't that just the same as though we are all not moving at all? And then they're just navigating the open spots? I mean, so in other words, if you are all going 200 miles an hour, does it really matter that you're going 200 miles an hour? Because <laughs> you're just maneuvering among all the other cars that are going 200 miles an hour. Does it really take fast reaction times? Absolutely, that's a great question, but it definitely does change a lot of things, mainly because of when you push speeds uh, that fast, what happens is aerodynamics change greatly. And we're actually going so fast that we can spin out or crash with another car not even touching us, just from them getting within inches of us in a corner is enough to make us spin out because the airflow over the car gets disrupted from Whoa. another car next to you. So it definitely is quite a bit different. Uh, and I think for the fans too watching, right? If we weren't going 200 miles per hour, maybe it wouldn't be as exciting. Although it is kind of fun to see golf cart racing. <laughs> You ever been in a golf cart, electric golf cart race? They have their own level of, of, of suspense. Um, and, and, and Nurk, you, to, to go 100 miles an hour and have that be some kind of special brain focus only really matters if you were maneuvering, right? So 
this is not just a like a sprint from beginning to start. You, do you have to go around cones or or, or markers? Yeah, so the, the Drone Racing League creates uh, basically an obstacle course that we have to yeah. navigate through to complete a lap. And typically we do two laps. Um, and we have six uh, competitors at the same time competing for those two laps. So, you know, when you're looking at building a race line or taking an apex, you have to be aware not only of three dimensions, but where the other people are positioned on the track and where you are relative to them. And are you taking higher risk kind of situations to make a pass or um, in the, there's a lot that goes into deciding a, like a drones racing line um, different it be, because of having other people on the track, especially. So Anthony, in a sense, you're not on, on an obstacle course, but the other cars are obstacles in that sense. So that's what you're navigating. Is that a fair comparison? Absolutely. It actually sounds very similar talking to Nurk as far as the way you have to adjust your racing line because of other cars or in his case, other drones on the course. So you may not be able to approach a corner in, in our case, the same way you would without other cars around you, which can make it more difficult because certain parts of the racetrack are rougher than others. There's less rubber laid down. There might be less grip and things like that. So you definitely have to compensate for that. And like Nurk said, some situations are higher risk than others, and you have to make that split second decision. So my last question before we get to our other experts here and other inquisitors. Uh, so, so Anthony, at any given moment, we know and you know your life is at risk because you're going 200 miles an hour and speed kills if no one ever told you that before. Whereas Nurk, yes, in his brain, he's riding the drone. So he can crash the drone and he still lives to see another day. But psychologically, he thinks he's going that fast. So Nurk, do you feel like your life is at risk? I definitely don't feel that my life is at risk. But the, I, what I think happens when, even when you take your body out of that situation is that there's still kind of a pressure cooker of different stresses going on. So, you know, my, my life is not at risk and, and, you know, I am completely blown away by the stuff that um, racing car drivers do. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's also pulling in different kinds of levels of stress and, and just pressure cooking it into not just my whole body, you know, manipulating controls, but down to just my two fingertips, you know, and that it, it kind of changes the game a little bit. I think um, Anthony probably spending time in iRacing, you experience a similar kind of, the pressure is very similarly high, but maybe in a different way. All right. Cool. So Chuck, you got a question for Heather? Yeah. Um, you know, when you hear these guys talk, I mean, what what is going on in the brain, Heather, to get these type of reaction times so that they can respond to their surroundings? Is it truly faster reaction times or is it that they've done it so many times that the circumstances seem to slow down oh. for their brain? And finally, uh, would they benefit from amphetamines? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I mean, the answer is that it's a little of everything, right? We all have um, inherent reaction times and we can respond within, you know, milliseconds. You have stimuli that comes into the brain via our senses. It processes it. It makes a very quick decision about whether to act or not and how to act. And then it sends signals to your muscles to respond. And that all happens within, a, within milliseconds, less than a second. Um, and so a, mil a millisecond is a thousandth of a second. So in thousandths correct. of a second, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's say within 300 milliseconds, you can, that whole process can occur and you can get information from the environment, make a decision and then physically react. Um, and so that's pretty constant that, that sort of reaction time amongst people, but where it can vary is in that decision-making process. So the more experience you have, the more you've practiced, um, the easier it is to make those split second decisions. And not only that, to enact the right kinds of behaviors to succeed at the task you're doing, right? So anyone could have a really quick reaction time, let's say to um, swinging the bat to hit a ball, but only those who are very well practiced can actually be accurate. So it's about speed and accuracy, not just being quick, but making the right moves so that you could be successful in your endeavor. Yeah, so, so Nurk and Anthony, are each of you now so practiced that this becomes autonomic. So to Heather's point, are you actually any longer thinking about what you're doing? Or is it just you're, you feel the force <laughs> and, you, and it just 
and it unfolds just the way it has all the previous times. Um, I'll jump in really quick and just say, I perform my best when I can let my um, reflexes take over. So when I'm not thinking about something and I can let my brain just autopilot and, and, and respond um, the way that I've trained it to and not be thinking directly about it, that's when I'm going to perform at my highest level. I think a lot of things that come into play are the speeds almost as you practice it, eventually uh, it becomes somewhat instinct and letting your instinct take over. And sometimes you make the wrong decisions and uh, sometimes you make the right one. So it's almost like going back and trying to remember what worked and what didn't to learn from that. But in the moment, you are you don't have time to not think, but you, you don't have time to think about your decision, right? And lay out all the details and what could be best. You just have to do it. And that's where instinct sort of takes over. And I like a Nerf using the term autopilot because that sort of is what it's like. It's almost you have so much adrenaline pumping and you're in some sort of special, uh, you have some sort of special powers that you don't have casually, but in the moment uh, you're able to make those fast decisions. And just to be clear, you're using the term instinct not the way a biologist would because they would use it. Instinct is something you have without training. You're referring to what your snap decision that you can make without thinking because you've had to make that decision before multiple times and it becomes just part of your uh, your ability to respond quickly. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. And, and Heather, uh, Anthony, uh, how much does it matter in the head where Anthony doesn't want to die? <laughs> so, right. <laughs> doesn't that matter evolutionarily in terms of how he's going to behave and the decisions he makes on the track? Well, I mean, the key thing is, is exactly what they said, is this difference between explicit and implicit, right? When you're first learning anything, like riding a bike, you have to consciously think about each move or when you're learning how to play tennis. And conscious thought is slower than unconscious thought or, it, or what we're calling implicit, right? So with enough practice, those things that used to be explicit or conscious get relegate, relegated to parts of the brain that are automatic or unconscious and quicker. And also the unconscious can process much more information um, in a shorter period of time. So the idea is to get enough practice to be, make it implicit. Now, when you're talking about the fear aspect, you know, the, the high stakes and the adrenaline, well, I think the, the, the professional athletes at whatever, in whatever sport um, have learned how to be cool and calm um, and make good decisions under, you know, despite the fear. I think you know there's what we call an optimal level of arousal. Too little arousal and it, you're not gonna have your best performance, but too much and it can mess up your performance. So the idea is that you wanna have enough arousal that you're, it's gonna accelerate, but not too much. And now if I was to get into a, you know, a car and race, it would be too much for me, right? But they've gotten to a point where they can remain cool and calm even under when there's high stakes. This is for Heather. Um, outside of event training and getting out of your own head, what other techniques can these guys use to speed up the process that's going on when they're racing mentally? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's about what they had alluded to is this letting go, is how to turn down parts of your prefrontal cortex that are um, sort of inner critics or thinking about how are you doing or have to do with anxiety or fear and ways in which you can turn that down and allow your body to do what it was trained to do automatically is you can practice things like meditation. You can um, practice what, you know, people try to get into these flow states and they can get into them in different ways. For some people, it's listening to music. For some people, it's going for a run or painting. And so when you're not engaging in the sport, it's a good thing to try to practice these techniques of letting go so that when you are under the high stakes, it'll be easier for you to let go in those situations. Anthony Nurk, it's been great to have you. Nurk, especially this is your second time on Star Talk. And maybe Anthony, we can keep track of you when you become Gen Y. Affinity <laughs> racer <laughs> instead of Gen X. Uh, no, but we would love to continue to track your career. Um, NASCAR has a lot of physics going on in it, and there are other angles we could take on this sport. We'd be delighted to have you back on. I would love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Gary, Chuck, as always, Star Talk Sports Edition only happens with the two of you. I've been Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I will continue to be Neil deGrasse Tyson when we're done here. This is Star Talk Sports Edition.